Welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Landheis and I am the director of SPARC, the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resources Center. Um, as many of you know, January is Stalking Awareness Month. So thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon, or it could be morning, depending on which time zone you're joining us for. Um, today we're going to talk about the coordinated response to stalking. And many of you may already be working on coordinated responses to domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, you may be starting to consider what that looks like for stalking. Um, please put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, my colleague Julia is on as well, and she will be trying to monitor the chat and bring to my attention anything uh, that we need to discuss and go over. Um, but we'll also be asking you lots of questions. So we would love if you would participate in the chat with us so we can get an idea of what it is that you're needing and how Spark can help you in your efforts to try to elevate the coordinated response in the community that you're working in. For those of you that don't know, Spark is uh, funded by the Office on Violence Against Women. We are what they call a comprehensive technical assistance and training provider, meaning that we work with anybody who works with victims and offenders in stalking cases. So if you are a college, if you are working in victim services or in the criminal justice professions, we are here to help you. So we can do training. Um, we offer quarterly webinars like this, um, where we will record this webinar and it will be available on our website under our training archives. It takes about two weeks to get a, the recording back um, and to have the closed captioning added. So please know and please be patient for a couple of weeks um, and then you'll see it show up on our archives on our website. And that website is stalkingawareness.org. So if you haven't visited our website, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, obviously, one of the things I want to highlight during the month of January is the fact that we have a ton of resources for Stalking Awareness Month. We have posts that you can share. We have information that you can uh, use to train individuals in your community. We have um, posts that you can send and information and newsletter information that you can include, uh, letters to the editor, et cetera. So a bunch of resources that are available in English and in Spanish on our website. So go to that website. And then the other thing that I want to point out to all of you is we have a lot of what we call practitioner resources. And so regardless of whether you're in the victim services field, you're working on a campus, there are informational resources on our website that you can download and use. So there are guides for how do you advocate on behalf of stalking victims, their safety plans, et cetera. And we have a lot of victim resources on our website as well. Now, Spark does not work with victims directly. So please do not refer victims of stalking to our organization because we're going to have to end up referring them back to your local programs. So understand that while we have lots of victim resources on there, those resources are for victims to be able to find as well as for all of you who are working with victims directly. So before we get started, we're going to talk a little bit about what is it that we're talking about when we talk about stalking. And for those of you that have attended Spark webinars before, thank you for joining us again. If this is your first webinar, you might be thinking, why are we talking about the definition of stalking? Like, I've been doing this work for a really long time. I know what we're talking about. I don't need to start with like one-on-one -on -one stuff. But what's surprising to me is no matter how often we do trainings across the country. There's always some disagreement about what it is exactly that we're talking about when we talk about stalking. And so the definition that we're gonna use today so that we can kind of ground all of our work is what we call a behavioral definition. And that's different from the legal or statutory definition that you have in your state. So keep that in mind. As we go forward, we're gonna be basing a lot of our discussion on that behavioral definition of stalking. And the behavioral definition that we're gonna use might seem familiar to all of you, either because you're already doing stalking work or because um, you are used to what's showing up in your state code about stalking. And we say that stalking is a pattern of behavior that's directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to either fear for their safety or the safety of somebody else, or to experience emotional distress. So I'm curious, when I say that stalking is a pattern of behavior, in the chat, tell me how many incidents you think have to occur to establish a pattern. How many incidents are we looking for? 
So as you can see, and I love that you're all super active in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> as you all can imagine, uh, presenting into a deep void when I don't get interaction with an audience is really difficult. So I love that you're all super interactive already. But you're also noticing if you're following the chat that the answers are differing. And some of you are saying we need a lot of incidents. Some of you are saying it depends. <laughs> I love the it depends answers, right? Um, and some of you are saying it's one or more. Some of you are saying it's two or more, three or more. Now, some of you may have a particular answer because your state statute might require a certain number of incidents. If state statutes require a certain number of incidents, obviously we're gonna have to use that as our legal and statutory foundation. But when we're just talking about the behavioral definition, we would say it's two or more incidents. But the thing that you need to keep in mind is that stalkers are extremely creative and they are going to vary their tactics not only based on what the reaction of the victim is, but also based on our reaction as a responder. Let me give you an example. We might have an offender who sends text messages and then the victim stops responding to those text messages, which is something we usually encourage as responders, right? Don't respond. And the victim's getting text messages and when the, respond, or when the offender doesn't get any reaction from the victim, then they start driving by the victim's house or they show up at the victim's place of work. Now, those are two different tactics, but it's still an overall pattern of behavior. And for those of you that are in the criminal justice system, law enforcement, et cetera, usually that's defined in your state statute as a course of conduct. So keep in mind that we might have different tactics and that the offender is going to vary those tactics, but it's still considered a pattern of behavior. We don't need two text messages or two incidents of the offender driving by the victim's house. We can have different tactics and it's still considered a pattern. Then we say it's directed at a specific person, but we know stalking spills over to the victim's family, their children, their friends, their coworkers, pretty much anybody the offender thinks the victim has an emotional tie to, and that's why they target those individuals. But the part of the definition that usually kind of stumps people is why do we say it would cause a reasonable person to feel fear? Why in our definition, this is the behavioral definition, so don't say, oh, that's what the court requires, but why in our behavioral definition would we say that it would cause a reasonable person to feel fear? Why does it not just say it would cause a victim to feel fear? Any ideas? Why do we use a reasonable person standard in our behavioral defi definition? Why do we not just say it would cause a victim to feel fear? Okay, somebody says the perspective of a jury. Sure, absolutely. That's gonna be part of your standards, legal standards. Somebody said trauma responses. Yeah, in an attempt to, to be uh, objective. And that's just exactly it. What we know is that fear and emotional distress that happens in stalking cases can be really subjective. And that there might be something that's fear inducing for the victim that isn't fear inducing to those of us as responders. And what we have to do when we're working on stalking cases is consider the impact on the victim. And so I want you to look at this police report. This is just a snippet of a police report that we pulled, an actual police report. Okay, we didn't make these up. And this particular police report says that the victim contacted law enforcement when she got into her car to head to work because her car doors were locked. And on the driver's seat of the car was a Corona beer bottle cap. So she called law enforcement because there was a Corona beer bottle cap on the seat of her car. Now, I don't know what the response is like in your jurisdiction. Is this gonna be like lights and sirens and police are automatically gonna respond and the SWAT team's coming out and this is a big deal? Or is this more likely to fall into a, what? Why is this person calling? Would law enforcement be dispatched? Would they call the victim for a follow-up? Would they go out and take a report? I'm gonna guess in most of your jurisdictions that somebody might go out and take a report. But why do you think the victim called law enforcement because of a beer bottle cap? What do you wanna know about this particular call? <laughs> Some of you have been on our webinars before. Somebody said context is key, right? And everybody wants to say, who placed it there, right? Is this the beer that the offender drinks? Why is it in her car? What does the beer bottle signify to her, right? 
Who put it there? Are we sure she locked the doors, right? You have lots of questions and you guys are absolutely going down the right path, things that you wanna know. Well, if we look at more information in this particular report, the victim goes on to say that yesterday she celebrated her two year anniversary of being sober. And the individuals in our AA group had been sending her messages congratulating her on that anniversary. And she thinks the suspect placed the beer bottle cap on her car seat to mess with her emotionally because seeing anything related to alcohol is a trigger for her. And she believes the suspect is monitoring her messages is that's the only way that he would know about the anniversary. Now, what questions do you have? Or does that solve everything? And now law enforcement can just go to that person, arrest them immediately and throw them in jail. For what crime? Yeah. So some people wanna know, is it possible that the offender is in the victim's AA group? And other people are saying there's so much more going on or hmm, what do we think could happen? Are there prior reports? about the suspect, excellent question. Other people wanna know what kind of messages do we think the offender is monitoring? Is it Facebook messages? Is it text messages? Are there, is there reason to believe that the car was actually locked? Did the offender have a key to the car? Why is it Corona? Is that the drink that she used to drink? Is that the drink that the offender used to drink? And the reasonable person, as somebody pointed out, might say, this looks really confusing but is it a stalking case? Or is it that somebody got drunk last night and she blacked out and she doesn't remember leaving the beer bottle cap on her own vehicle? We have a lot of questions, right? I love that many of you immediately zeroed in on this means something to the victim. And you're exactly right. Because what we have to keep in mind in these types of cases is there might be something that seems confusing or not quite making sense to those of us as responders, but that is fear inducing and terrifying to a victim. But unless we know the history, unless we delve deep into understanding what does that beer bottle cap mean to her? What did she think was gonna happen? What kind of messages did it seem that she was being sent by this beer bottle cap? How was the offender monitoring those messages? What kind of history does the offender have it's complex, right? And so often when we're working on stalking cases, we're given one piece of the puzzle, just like that very first police report that I gave you, one piece. And we have to dig deep to find the other pieces of the puzzle to figure out what's exactly going on in these particular cases. But the problem is as responders, no matter whether you're in the criminal justice system or victim services, or you're working on a campus, we're all dealing with limited time and resources. I'm guessing that none of you are underworked and overpaid. And so to expand on that particular incident that has happened requires time and energy on our part as responders, as well as working with the victim to be able to give us more information. And so often there's behaviors that have a specific meaning to the victim that don't mean anything to the rest of us, unless we're asking more questions. And many times there's things that happen in stalking crimes that the incident in and of itself isn't a crime. And it doesn't become criminal until we look at it within the context of a stalking case. It's not criminal to send somebody a text message or to drive down a public street or show up at a baseball game. Now, obviously if there's a civil protection order in place, we can put all these other clauses, but those incidents in and of themselves are not criminal until we try to put them together in a stalking case. And so we are looking at crimes that are resource intensive, that require us to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And oftentimes we're deal dealing with a victim who's traumatized, who is very scared about what's been happening and who feels like nobody is believing that and that nothing is going to stop the offender from potentially harming them. And so these cases are pretty complex. And so how do we work together with other organizations in our jurisdiction and with our victim at the center of what we're doing to try to build that coordinated response in these particular cases. Because what we know is even though that there are criminal statutes that exist to try to hold offenders accountable, 
we have to meet the probable cause threshold. We have to be able to take that case and move it forward through prosecution. And then we also have to think about what happens if we do have an offender who's prosecuted, how are they monitored if they're released before or after court dates? If they're put on probation, are we monitoring them at a higher level to watch out for stalking behavior? It's not easy, right? And so thinking about, yes, we have these options here. And as we look at these particular offenses, we have, every state has a statute when it comes to stalking. Some of them are better than others. Most of them have elements that are gonna be very familiar because you saw it in that behavioral definition. We also have tribal codes that have to do with stalking. And that's important to consider as well when we look at tribal jurisdiction, because if we have an offender who goes in and out of tribal territory or crosses state lines to commit a stalking crime, that's a federal offense. There's a federal charge of stalking if somebody crosses in and out of those state lines or over that tribal jurisdiction. So to keep in mind, one of the things that we need to be thinking about is as we move forward, how do we work together to be able to leverage the laws that we do have at our disposal? Because sometimes we can't get enough probable cause to actually charge stalking. But what can we charge? What can we do to enhance the safety of victims, even if we're not able to hold the offender accountable at this particular moment in time? And how do we set this up to be able to show that we can work together to be able to address these particular crimes? And one of the things that happens when we talk about addressing stalking is when we go into a jurisdiction, people say to us, well, you know, Jennifer, I get that it's important to build the response to stalking, but the issue is we don't see that many stalking crimes. Like we work with a lot of victims with domestic violence and a lot of victims with sexual assault. We just don't see very many victims of stalking. And so, yes, I think it's important, but, you know, compared to our other numbers, it's not a priority for us. And I'm always a little bit curious about that because the stats will tell us that one in six women and one in 17 men experience stalking at some point in their lifetime. And those stats are almost as high as that of domestic violence and sexual assault. But I'm going to guess that many of you do not work this with as many stalking victims as you work with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. So if the stats are really that high, why do you think it is that we are failing to see those corresponding numbers of victims either in our criminal justice system or reaching out to those of us that do victim services. Why are we not seeing the same number of stalking victims that we're seeing victims of domestic violence and sexual assault? Somebody said it takes somebody to connect the dots. Yep. Why else do you think? Harder to prove. Yep. Victims might not recognize that it's stalking. Absolutely. What else? Fear of reporting or coming forward at all. Why else do you think we're not seeing the same number of victims? Yeah, some victims might not recognize that it's a crime, right? Or know who's doing it. Other ideas? I'm seeing a lot of responses that have to do with victims not identifying it. What about for those of us as responders? What about our responsibility? I would agree. We might have responders who don't see the signs, right? And that we don't necessarily view it as the same level of urgency as we might domestic violence and sexual assault, that we might second guess or not perceive that what's happening is an immediate threat, absolutely. We may be minimizing what's happening or not understand the context, absolutely. Other ideas? Yeah. And as somebody mentioned, once we introduce the use of technology in the case, it can be even harder, right? Because we might have individuals who aren't familiar with how to gather evidence. We might know what, not know what kind of technology the offender is using to be able to track the victim and interact in that particular case. Yeah. And there's not enough programs, right? If you look across the US, there are, well, there's maybe one standalone stalking program in the whole United States. The rest are all domestic violence and sexual assault advocacy programs that victims of stalking can access services from. But 
do victims of stalking know that? Do we as responders know where to send victims of stalking, right? And I would agree, a lot of times our court systems don't give the same level of urgency and response in stalking cases as we do in domestic violence or family violence cases, absolutely. The other thing we know is that some of the challenges that happen in these particular cases is, as some of you mentioned, it's a contextual crime and that those individual acts might not be criminal. And as most of you mentioned, sometimes victims don't identify what's happening to them as stalking. It may be difficult to gather evidence and that these are long resource intensive investigations that can play out over a long period of time. The other thing that we need to be thinking about when it comes to stalking is that we also have some of the institutional barriers that exist. And I want you to be thinking about in your jurisdiction, as you're looking at coordinating that response to stalking, what does reports taking and documentation look like? And let me give you an example. Oftentimes law enforcement, when we're working with them and training them will say, you know, I absolutely think that we have a very robust response to stalking. And when we delve into what does that response look like, that response is based in domestic violence response. And they say, you know, if there's an intimate partner stalker, we have uh, investigators and patroller trained on domestic violence, and those cases are looked at and given special attention. And my question is always uh, then, well, what about those cases that don't involve intimate partner stalkers? Because it's about 50% of stalking cases are not involving a current or former intimate partner. So for instance, if the victim has a vehicle whose tires were slashed and the victim calls and makes a report and patrol comes out and takes that report, an incident report is often written up. And if the victim says, oh, I know the person who did this, they asked me out a couple of weeks ago, I told them, no, I think they're mad at me. If that person is interviewed and asked questions, the offender probably says, I was nowhere close to the vehicle. I don't even know who you're talking about. And so an incident report may be written up or the fact that they responded to a particular address may be written up. It's doubtful that that is looked at as the first tactic in a pattern of behavior that's directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. <laughs> it's probably not viewed at as a potential stalking crime until something else happens and then something else happens. And by this time, the victim's frustrated. They feel like nobody believes them and it doesn't go anywhere. And oftentimes when we're working on stalking cases, we're working backwards because several things have happened. And sometimes we get frustrated and we say to victims, why didn't you report this? And they say, I did, but no one took me seriously. Or I didn't think it was a crime. Or my friends said, it's not criminal. Why are you gonna call the police? Or I called my campus security and they said it wasn't a crime. So they didn't report it to local law enforcement. So be thinking about what does report taking and documentation look like in your community, not just with law enforcement. Victim advocates are often like, well, the criminal justice system, but think about your agency as a victim advocate. If someone called your agency at two o'clock in the morning and said they were being harassed by someone that they work with, would they be offered the same level of services like shelter or civil protection orders as somebody who called and said that my husband beat me up last night? Because as advocacy programs, we're trained to understand what domestic violence looks like. And we have a robust amount of services available, but would we recognize stalking when it was described that way? Or would we unintentionally screen that victim out and tell them to call a homeless shelter? Because that happens to victims all across the country. So thinking about how are we sharing information with one another, with written releases and all the things that we know about confidentiality, et cetera. How are we providing cross-training within our communities? What does our uniform response look like? And how do we understand stalking when we're looking at it in the context of a lethality factor, okay? Questions that you have so far. Anything else? Okay. 
questions that we all have, we're all mulling over in our mind, right? So one of the things that we have to be thinking about then is when we look at the behavior that happens in stalking cases, oftentimes we don't necessarily identify that what hap is happening is stalking. Either victims don't identify it or we as responders don't necessarily identify it. So one of the things that we need to be thinking about is how do we come up with a framework and see that um, what's happening in these particular cases has to do with stalking, even if we don't necessarily think of it as stalking to begin with. And one of the things that I would encourage you as an individual and your agency and your coordinated response in your community to think about is to adopt this particular framework. And this framework we refer to as the SLY framework, and it stands for surveillance, life invasion, intimidation, and interference. And what we know is that when the surveillance tactics are happening, when the offender is doing things like following the victim or watching the victim, um, they're waiting to show up someplace, so they may wait, wait outside um, the place where the victim gets their haircut or the gas station where the victim fills up their car to just happen to run into the victim. Or they're obtaining information about the victim from someone or proxy stalking the victim, which is when you use a third party to stalk someone. When that kind of stuff is happening, oftentimes what victims think is if there's in-person contact, they may identify that it's a stalking case. If there's surveillance behavior happening, victims are more likely to identify that it's a stalking case. And those of us as responders are more likely to identify that it's a stalking case. And when it contains these types of behaviors, these are the cases that are more likely to make it through the criminal justice system. But if we're trying to build a case where we're looking at a pattern of events that has happened, the more incidents that we have, the better our case, criminal justice wise, civil justice wise, if we have a victim who's trying to get a protection order. And if you're like, I don't work a lot in the criminal and civil justice system, it's also important to identify these things because it helps us adequately safety plan with victims. So when we're looking at these particular cases, one of the things that we need to be thinking about is, are we asking victims the right questions to be able to determine the full scope of everything that's been happening in these particular cases? And oftentimes when I'm working with responders and they'll say to me, oh, we scream for stalking all the time. Like we ask victims about stalking. I'm like, that's awesome. Tell me what questions you ask them. And they say, well, we ask the victim, are you being stalked? And unfortunately that's not the right question to ask. Because what we know is if victims are being stalked and they are experiencing this kind of behavior, if you just ask them, are you being stalked? They're gonna say no. What we have to do is describe the tactics that are happening in these particular situations. So we have to talk about all these different things that are listed under the slide when it comes to surveillance. And we have to think about stalking isn't just the surveillance piece of things. We have to talk about life invasion. Is the offender making unwanted contact at life or at home? Are they making phone calls? Are they invading the victim's property? Are they trying to humiliate? The victim? Are they harassing the victim's friends and family? All of those things are really important. So be thinking about as we're looking at these next couple of slides, the questions that you can ask the victims that you're working with in order to build a better case, but also in order to adequately safety plan. Are we asking about interference through sabotage or attack? So is the offender um, sabotaging the victim's work reputation? Are they trying to sabotage their credit? Are they interfering with custody? Are they trying to keep the victim from leaving a certain place? Um, are they attacking friends and family? All of those things happen frequently in stalking cases. And I was always a little bit curious that I would find information out about a stalking case. And then when I would accompany a victim to make a report to law enforcement or to their meeting with a prosecutor, they wouldn't mention these things that were happening. And I was always like, why are they not bringing that up? So I started asking the individuals that I was working with and I would say, I'm curious why you didn't mention that to the police officer. And you know what their response was? They didn't ask me. So if we're not asking, victims about this, 
they're not going to tell us. So asking specific questions about intimidation. Has the offender damaged the victim's property? Are they set in for forcing confrontations? Um, are they threatening to harm themselves or to harm the victim? So things to be thinking about as you move forward and you're trying to improve your coordinated response is, first of all, within your own agency, are you asking questions about the slide, slide framework, okay? And the other thing to be thinking about is as we move forward, now what, right? So somebody just said, okay, are these questions somewhere that we can get a copy of? Yes, so Julia has mentioned that you're gonna get a copy of the PowerPoint and that's available in the PowerPoint. So you are more than welcome to um, use the information that's included in that PowerPoint to be able to ask those questions when you're working with victims. So other questions. And I'm gonna ask, uh, we have about 300 of you that are on the chat. So those of you that I'm sorry have experienced stalking and that are sharing your personal story, first of all, I just wanna remind you that this is recorded and it's gonna be available publicly. So please use caution in doing so. The other thing that I would ask is if you would try to keep those comments limited in the chat because I wanna make sure that I'm getting people's questions about their community response. Um, and then if you need help in getting hooked up with a local victim advocate who can help you, we're happy to refer you to folks. Just keep in mind that we can't work with you directly um, at the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center. Um, so I would just ask for those of you that are putting comments in the chat to just think carefully about the information that you're sharing um, and to limit those comments um, to the what we're look, talking about today as far as the coordinated response. So um, any other questions as we move forward? Some of you have mentioned um, what happens when we have technology occurring in these particular cases? And we could do a whole other presentation on the use of technology to stock. But I included for you some examples of how, how we see technology fit in within that particular slide framework. So for those of you that are like, I really like that framework and I would like to be able to use that in working with other individuals, these are some of the questions that you can ask about and specific examples that you can think about when you're looking at the use of technology in these particular cases. Is that helpful? And again, you'll all have a copy of the PowerPoint. So someone said our medical uh, folks aware of this framework so they can ask the right questions. You know, I think it depends on what the level of training is like in your community, Rachel. One of the things that we wanna be thinking about is, you know, there's 277 of us on today, which is fantastic. And how are we taking this information and sharing it with the other individuals in our community, the medical responders, et cetera. Because we do know that one of the places lots of individuals reach out to for help is the medical and mental health community. And are those individuals trained on what to look for? Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. Someone said, what about work for workplace professionals? We see a lot of um, employers who struggle with the response to stalking they may have been trained on domestic violence and sexual assault, but you know, how do we share this information? Somebody's saying, okay, well, I want to, I want the rest of my community to know this information. How do we get them trained? So Spark provides training to anybody who receives violence against women. So if you are an OVW recipient, we can give training to your local community agency if you get violence against women funding. Some of you are like, I don't know if we get that funding. If you get stop funding through your local um, or state jurisdiction, then you probably get OVW funds. There is a place on Spark's website to request training. But for those of you that are like, I want to give this information to our local health providers, et cetera, we have ex essentially trainings in a box on our website. So if you go to our website, you can look for training modules and it has a PowerPoint and information to share about stalking gives you a script of what to say, it gives you the slides, et cetera. So you can do this own, same similar type of presentation in your own community for the individuals that you're asking about. So we make that as simple as possible for you to be able to just download and take and put into place in your community. So hopefully that answered your question, Drew. Anyone else? And someone said, you know, sometimes SANE nurses are trained to ask, um, absolutely think about, um, what kind of questions they're asking, um, and is that the same across all jurisdictions? Um, one of the things that we're pretty passionate about um, at Spark is that we firmly believe that victims shouldn't luck into good responses, right? Like we should all have the same level of training and understanding and that no matter if the victim comes in and talks to me or talks to Julia, they're still going to get the same level of response. And so think about within your own community, 
especially your own, own organization, is everybody le receiving the same level of training and understanding when it comes to stocking? And if they're not, there's a ton of resources on our website that you can use. And Julia just linked the PowerPoint again um, in uh, the chat for everyone. Um, and Julia, I think you might want to relink it because it might have just gone, gone to a couple of individuals um, instead of everyone. So if you would relink re that, that would be great. Okay, other questions. And I think I'm trying, I'm trying to stay on top of the chat as much as possible. All right. So some of you mentioned when we were talking about what's the difficulty um, in responding to victims of stalking, some of you said, well, sometimes we miss it because we're looking at the domestic violence piece of things. And one of the things that we know is that when stalking happens within the context of intimate partner violence, we have some of our most dangerous cases. We know that the most common use of the criminal justice system prior to either an attempted or completed intimate partner homicide is somebody report, reporting intimate partner stalking. So some victims are coming forward. It's what we do with that information. The other thing that we need to be thinking about is we do miss it within the context of domestic violence. Now, I don't wanna be picking on law enforcement here because it feels like I am a little bit um, and because several of you mentioned in the chat um, that you struggle with law enforcement taking reports. So this is just one example and this is just from law enforcement. What I will tell you is we miss it within every single discipline, okay? Advocates, we miss it all the time, okay? So what this particular study did did, um, and there's two of them highlighted on the screen for you, is they looked at law enforcement's response to domestic violence. And the perhaps best illustration is that first example where they pulled about 3,000 domestic, or about 1,800 uh, domestic violence reports. And when they looked at them, about one in six, so about 300 of them, had enough information within the police report where police could have also charged stalking in addition to domestic violence. And out of those 300, they only did so in one case. Even though the information was enough in the report to also charge stalking. What we know is we often miss stalking within the context of domestic violence. And I think it happens for a couple of reasons. And I'll use myself as an example. I grew up in the domestic violence world. I did this work for several years before I had my aha moment. And my aha moment came when I was working in domestic violence cases and the offender was really jealous and controlling and possessive and they would monitor the victim's social media and where the victim went and they would cut the victim off from their friends and family and were very isolating. I used words like the offenders controlling and possessive and jealous. And I fit it in my nice little power and control wheel that talks about domestic violence. And we labeled it as coercive control. And I think as a field, we have done a really good job in helping people understand that domestic violence is just that. It's more than just the physical and sexual violence. But I think we've done a huge disservice when we don't label that intimidation, possessiveness, jealousy, and control as stalking behavior because it is. It's still a pattern of behavior that's directed at the victim that would make them fearful. And some of you might be thinking, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter whether we label it domestic violence or stalking, we're still gonna work with victims. And my community is much more trained in domestic violence and they get it and we're gonna be much more likely to move the DV case forward. So what's the point in also labeling it or charging it as stalking? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, our intimate partner stalkers are our most dangerous offenders. They're more likely to physically approach the victim, to use weapons, to escalate their behavior quickly. And these are the offenders who don't stop. They recidivate at a rate of much higher than 60%. And what we also know is that when you have domestic violence plus stalking happening, you have some of your most dangerous cases. I'm willing to bet that many of you that have a coordinated response to domestic violence are working on some kind of lethality assessment. You might use like the lethality assessment protocol. You might um, use like the danger assessment by Jacqueline Campbell. You might have a threat assessment tool that you use, or at the very least, 
many of you may be working on those cases and you know like when the victim separates from the offender, if the victim's pregnant, um, if the offender has access to weapon, that those are dangerous cases. But what most people don't realize is that in 85% of attempted and 76% of completed intimate partner femicides, so where a male offender killed a female victim, there was an episode of stalking within the year prior to the murder or attempted murder. And in fact, stalking is the number eight lethality factor in intimate partner homicides. Now, this is what we call a meta-analysis. So what a meta-analysis does is look at a whole bunch of studies that look at lethality risks. And this meta-analysis said stalking is the number eight risk factor, meaning that if a victim of domestic violence is also experiencing stalking, they are 300% more likely to be killed by the offender. But if we never identified it as stalking and we never named it as stalking, and we never charged it as stalking. How were we supposed to know or prevent the potential homicide in these cases? Most people intuitively know that stalking is part of the domestic violence, but we often don't name it and charge it that way because we feel more comfortable in our response to domestic violence. But if we don't give victims the language that they need in making reports, and we don't safety plan around stalking as part of the domestic violence, we do a huge disservice to victims. Questions about this connection? Some of you are saying the information is new to you. Yeah, someone else is saying, I can't re ever uh, recall working with a survivor in shelter whose offender wasn't stalking them, right? Other questions? So if you are working on the coordinated response to domestic violence in your community, many of you might be using some kind of threat assessment tool, like the danger assessment or the lethality assessment protocol, et cetera. One of the things that we also need to be thinking about is that tools to identify the level of risk in stalking is also really important. So one of the things we need to be thinking about is how can we work with victims to determine the level of risk that is happening in particular cases. And most people are not aware that there is a stalking specific risk assessment that exists. And you can find that at either coercivecontrol.org or stalkingrisk.com. So how many of you are already using this tool? How many of you would say that this is new information? Go ahead and put that in the chat. And while you're doing that, I want to respond to someone said, you know, one of the things that can be hard is that we're often asking victims to repeat their story. And one of the things that you might want to be thinking about is using something like a risk assessment tool to be able to communicate with other individuals across the system, the level of risk that is happening in these particular cases. Clearly, you would want to do so with victims express written permission, especially if you're an advocacy folks. So we need to be thinking about confidentiality, et cetera. Um, Stephanie, I always appreciate, Stephanie's been on several of my trainings before and has said, you know, I've used this tool many times since our first training that we did, and that was almost three years ago, Stephanie, um, and she says it saved many lives. Uh, Stephanie had the opportunity to use it in a couple of cases where we identified some really high level of risk, and law enforcement was able to make some arrests and bring people into custody um, that, I don't know that <laughs> the level of risk would have been uh, clearly identified had they not been using the SHARP tool, so. Okay, so many of you are saying it's new. Some of you are saying I, I've heard of it, but I've never used it. So what HARP does is look at the level of risk that has happened um, in stalking cases. And one of the things that we need to be thinking about is oftentimes using a risk assessment can be super helpful in not only helping victims to articulate what is exactly happening in these particular cases, but also for us to be able to communicate. So for those of you that are like, I feel like we ask victims to retell their story over and over and over again, could we consider something like using a SHARP assessment to be able to share information with our other agencies, okay? So something to think about in that way. Um, somebody said, what if there's more than one stalker involved? Um, you would have to do a separate assessment on each stalker in these particular cases, Maureen, uh, because it looks at um, just one particular individual in these cases. 
Um, somebody asked about the evaluation studies. So um, if you go to coercivecontrol.org, you can see the research that informed this particular case. It has not been formally evaluated, nor are there any plans to do so. Um, people always think evaluating tools like this is, a, is an easy endeavor and it's a very expensive and long endeavor. Um, but the whole tool is based on the research from Dr. Logan um, and that research is included on the SHARP site. So if you go to coercivecontrol.org, you can find that information about the tool and how it's research informed. So hopefully that answers your question, Rachel. Okay, so SHARP looks at 14 different risk factors in a stalking case. So it looks at um, what we call kind of like the big picture. So it looks to see, um, you know, what's the course of conduct? So it looks at the SLI framework. Um, has there been an escalation in this particular case? Um, is there a potential trigger coming up? So one of the things to be thinking about is a trigger might be the fact uh, that all of us are involved. If the criminal justice system is involved and we are looking at a potential court case or the offender being held accountable, that's potential trigger. Okay? It also looks to see um, what's the nature and context of the threats that the offender has been making. Um, for those of you that are trained in like suicide um, prevention and awareness, uh, you know that the more specific threats someone makes, the more danger is a, you know, present. And the same thing in this type of situation, the more specific threats that the offender might be making, the more potential danger in cases. Um, and it looks to see if the offender has the potential to follow through with this th those threats. Have they threatened something, then they follow through with it? Are they capable of those threats? Um, and what kind of persistence has the offender had despite the victim's resistance? So is there a civil protection order or a no contact order in place and the offender keeps violating that? Have they been arrested and they keep violating, right? Um, the other thing that we can be thinking about is what's the stalker's motive? You know, has, um, are they trying to get back together with the victim? Are they trying to ruin the victim's life? Are they obsessed with the victim? Um, are they engaging in proxy stalking? So are they using other people to stalk the victim, like their friends, their family members. Um, you know, sometimes people provide information to the offenders and they don't even know they're doing that. So maybe they're calling the victim's work and saying, is Jennifer in today? And they, you know, transfer the call to Jennifer's voicemail and the offender knows if Jennifer's at her desk or not today, okay? Um, what's the history of abuse towards the victim? So is there a history of domestic violence? Um, and Jira, I just gave an example of proxy, so um, hopefully you caught that, but I'm happy to give another one if there's, if you still need me to expand. Um, is there a history of abuse towards other people? Um, that darn leg in, in uh, questions and answers. Um, that history of abuse towards other people, so has the offender been um, a domestic violence offender towards other people? Are they a general violent offender? You know, are they somebody who gets, you know, in bar fights frequently? Um, do they have access to guns and weapons? And do they have any training in that? So if we have an offender who's in the military, um, who is former law enforcement, certainly they have much more training um, and access to weapons. And then it looks at the criminal history, mental health history, and substance abuse history. Now, one thing I wanna clear up is oftentimes people look at stalking offenders and say that they have mental health issues. The level of mental health issues in stalking offenders is actually pretty low. What stalking offenders have issues with is power and control, which people look at those behaviors and say, those are not mentally healthy behaviors. But many times the offender has issues with power and control, not a mental health issue. Certainly if they have a criminal history or substance abuse history that can contribute, but keep in mind that oftentimes stalking offenders have no criminal history. And they're very adept at talking through things and, you know, talking their way out of things. And the other thing that we need to be thinking about is what's the level of fear that the victim has um, and what kind of impact has that had on their life? So do we have a victim who has to live and work near the offender and how vulnerable are they because of that? Um, or um, do we have an offender who's using technology um, and are they victimizing the victim through that use of technology? So the risk assessment goes through all 14 of those factors. And if you're new to this, or you're like, I haven't used it before, what can be really super helpful is if you go to the Spark website, we have recorded trainings available. And one of the trainings that we have on our archives 
is me going through the risk assessment. So you have a case scenario, I actually pull off the risk assessment, we go through it together, and then you find out what happened as a result in that particular case. That can be extremely helpful to get you familiar with the risk assessment. The other thing that I would suggest is you can get on and play with it, okay? It is 48 questions. So before any of you are like, Jennifer, I don't have time to fill out 48 questions. It'll take you about 10 minutes to fill out the assessment, okay? It will not take you a long time. There are yes, no questions. It's a sliding scale on a lot of things. So it's not gonna take a huge amount of time. So get on the assessment. And one of the very first questions it will ask you is, are you just doing a test case? So get on there and think about a case that you've worked with or just play with the factors to be like, well, what happens if they have this happening? Or what happens if they have that happening? And you can get comfortable with the assessment. I would encourage you to do that. I used the assessment numerous times, just kind of playing around with it before I actually did it. Um, and somebody said, so are the levels of risk explained? So the Victoria, the thing to be thinking about when you look at this particular assessment is there's no level of risk. It will simply tell you the number of risk factors and it doesn't determine, it's not a weighted thing. So it's not like if you have three risk factors, it's low risk because number one, we would never want to label someone as low risk because we all know that we have worked on cases where only one risk factor was present and we still had the offender murder of the victim. So it doesn't, it's not a weighted score. It simply tells you how many out of the 14 risk factors exist. Hopefully that clears that up. Other questions about SHARP? I'm gonna give you guys a couple of seconds for questions to float in on the chat because there's always a little bit of delay. And thank you, Julia. Julia just linked to the um, webinar that um, I mentioned that's recorded and on the uh, Spark website. So um, that webinar on Shark, I think it's the last one on the list. So you're gonna have to scroll down because we did it about a year and a half ago. So other questions. And if any of you have used it before, Stephanie, I appreciate you um, uh, chiming in there with your experience. Anybody else um, that have used it, please feel to put that in the chat. So we said, what if the victim's family keeps um, inviting the stalker? <laughs> and, it, um, and then law enforcement is saying, well, if you invite them. Um, so one of the things to be thinking about, and somebody said, is the risk assessment validated now? Um, as I mentioned earlier, validation and evaluation is like a whole, <laughs> Like a whole other uh, kind of Pandora's box. Um, evaluating risk assessment tools is a little dicey um, and it's hugely expensive. Um, and Dr. Logan developed this tool without any funding. So not likely that it's going to be validated anytime soon. It's research informed. So you can certainly look at the research that's available on the coercive control site to give you insight into how it was developed. Somebody's gonna say, well, how does this happen then in court systems? If it's not validated, are people using it? People are using it all across the country. Um, I know Stephanie put in the chat that she's used it before in civil cases where they've gotten civil protection orders, et cetera. Um, so it's gonna be um, up to your jurisdiction. Um, and so ha um, definitely be talking about that, what can be introduced, et cetera. Sometimes what happens is the tool is done to gather more information. So as an investigative tool, and then we still use the same information that we was found out through our investigation. This just informs the investigation. So we're still able to get the information, the evidence and the proof without needing that particular information. So um, for those of you that are putting in the, in the uh, chat, you know, send me more information as you have upcoming webinars, et cetera. Um, we're not going to come through this chat because there's 300 of you on here. If you want to sign up for information from Spark, we have a newsletter sign up that if you sign up for our newsletter, um, we let you know when there's new webinars and new tools coming out. So do it that way um, and then you'll get access to all the information that we have coming out. So yeah. All right. Someone said uh, training on um, what's research-based and validated. Uh, absolutely, because uh, that's a whole another Pandora's box, but that's not what this webinar is about. So other questions. Thank you, Julia. Julia put our uh, newsletter information on there. And again, the nice thing about Sharp is it gives you two things. It gives you the narrative report on the level of risk, and it also gives you safety planning suggestions. So it helps you figure out how do we safety plan about the specific risks that are present in this particular case. So it can be super helpful if it if it's safe for a victim to take it with them, you can print it out, give it to the victim, 
Um, you could certainly use it to inform um, your coordinated response in your community about how you're going to level uh, elevate the level of safety for a victim as well. So one of the things that we have to consider then is when we do risk assessment, victims are afraid of lots of different things. Obviously, they're afraid of the offender, but they're also really afraid of the unknown. Where is the offender going to show up? What are they going to do, et cetera, is really important. And so be thinking about as you are working with victims that sometimes you have victims who don't outwardly express fear. And instead, they're frustrated and they're angry or they're apathetic because it's been going on for a long time. And so they have kind of a flat effect. And sometimes within the criminal justice system, so for those of us that are law enforcement or prosecuting attorneys, we have to cooperate the victim's level of fear because it's an element of the crime. And sometimes looking at what has changed for the victim, have they had um, changes in their personality? Were they an outgoing person who suddenly now doesn't interact with a lot of people because they're afraid of the stalker then targeting those people? Um, have they had to make changes to where they lived and the security measures that they have possible? Have they changed their employment? Um, have they taken down their social media? Um, are they no longer sleeping or eating? Are they isolating themselves from activities? Those changes can help us cooperate fear. Sometimes we get calls from, say for instance, prosecuting attorneys who are like, I don't really wanna put this victim on the stand because they don't express fear. And so we always have that conversation about, well, what could we use instead to show that the victim's fearful? Can we use the changes that have happened in their life as a form of understanding all the impact and cooperating that fear? And the other thing that we need to be thinking about is who else can cooperate that fear? Not only do we rely on victims' um, information, but um, can we, you know, document that um, the victim has applied for a protection order or that they've relocated or that they're trying to keep their, um, their, those events and location secret from someone else. Um, someone also asked, you know, in Canada, we don't have stocking task force. How do we get the, how do we get those? Um, and we don't have a ton in the U.S. either. And um, what I would tell you is sometimes we have a formal team that is working together in a coordinated effort to try to stop these particular cases and to really delve into domestic violence and sexual assault cases. More frequently, we have kind of um, informal teams. So people that we work with are champions at the you know, advocacy center or our champion in the DA's office, and we're working informally together. One of the things to be thinking about is as we build these particular responses, I'm gonna give you some suggestions in a few minutes of the things that you can be thinking about. And so sometimes we have to start with the internal training, both inter-agency and intra-agency, and then build it from there. So I'm gonna give you some suggestions about thinking about that, but also thinking about just because you don't have a formal team in place does not mean you can't continue to coordinate your response in these particular cases, even if it's an informal process. But the things I would encourage you to think about, of course, are the level of confidentiality and other things that exist that are necessary to be able to coordinate that response. The other thing that we can go back to thinking about when we were talking about um, the level of fear in these particular cases is thinking about where the victim works, um, where, what places they frequent and who else they may have had contact with that could help cooperate the level of fear that the victim is feeling. Um, you know, have they called 911? Have they talked to their daycare about the offender showing up? Have they mentioned to somebody at work that they're fearful, et cetera? Those individuals can help us cooperate the level of fear that victims are feeling and can be really helpful to document and bring forward in our civil and our criminal justice cases. The other thing that we want to be thinking about as we're working on these particular cases is how are we going beyond just, you know, gathering the information to really supporting and working with victims? And are we looking at advocating for them? How do we help document these particular cases? And one of the things that can be really helpful in stalking cases is for victims to keep a log about what has been happening. Because essentially in stalking cases, we're often kind of relying on victims 
to build their own cases. Like they have to tell us what has been happening, when it's been happening, how it's been happening. And people oftentimes encourage victims to keep a journal about these things. But that can be a little problematic because number one, victims don't know what level of probable cause is needed. They don't know what's important to write down or not important to write down. And so oftentimes they'll bring in like a 500 page journal and they'll hand it to the investigating officer and say, you know, here's the journal you told me to keep. And the officer doesn't have time to read 500 pages. And the victim only wrote about the stalking in two of the page, those pages and the rest of the other 498 pages were information about how they're feeling, et cetera. What can be more useful is a stalking incident and behavior log. We have these available on our website in English and in Spanish. For those of you that are from campuses, we have recently developed a campus specific incident log that recognizes that oftentimes students are reporting to people like Title IX offices, et cetera, not necessarily law enforcement. So what is on the log is information to victims on how to keep the log. That's on one side. And then on the other side is this log that you see in front of you that has the date, the time, the description, and the location of the incident. Why do you think we mention on here or bring up the location of the incident? Why is that important? Absolutely, jurisdiction. Some of you might have worked on a case um, and law enforcement, I'll talk to all of you first. So sometimes we're working on a case and victims say, well, I reported this to your office before. And you're looking it up and there's no incident report. There's no calls for service at this location. There's no history of 911 calls. And we're like, are you sure you reported it? And they're like, yes, I reported it to one of your fellow officers. And what actually happened is they reported it to county or to city or to the neighboring jurisdiction but victims don't understand that there isn't this wide database that everybody shares the information or they may not understand that you know if i report to the college that the college doesn't necessarily share information with a local jurisdiction etc so one of the things that we need to be thinking about is if we share the location that might tell us where else there are other reports that we need to be able to pull from and it helps us determine as someone mentioned is somebody crossing in and over state lines or are they crossing in and out of tribal territory, in which case we might have information as far as um, a federal case goes. So think about that. Um, and then we also have a place for victims to mention if there are potential witnesses. And so one of the things to be thinking about is oftentimes victims think of witnesses as the person who was physically present when something happened. But with the use of technology, sometimes victims are um, on a Snapchat video or they're FaceTiming a friend and that friend saw or heard something and they can be a potential witness. So sometimes it's important to share with victims that witnesses aren't just the people who might be physically present, but who might have overheard something, et cetera. Questions about those particular things? trying to keep up with the chat. Okay, so when we're working with victims, it's important to understand that victims cope in a variety of different ways, and there is no right way to cope with stalking. Some victims move inward, meaning they isolate themselves because they're afraid the stalking will affect other people, and so they kind of withdraw from friends and family. Some physically move away or they move against the offender in that they try to get a civil protection order, file for custody, get a divorce, et cetera, and make a police report. Some are moving outwards because they're connecting with all of us. They're making police reports, they're coming into our advocacy centers. Where people seem to have difficulty is when we have victims who are moving toward the offender and they're making contact with the offender. And to kind of go back to the person who said, well, what if family's inviting them? And people say, well, if they're inviting them over, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is sometimes other people play a role in that. And sometimes we have victims who text the offender or call the offender or engage in conversation with the offender because they're negotiating for their safety. They're doing a temperature check. 
And oftentimes I would get calls from law enforcement who'd be really frustrated who say, I don't have a stalking case because if this was a stalking case, my victim would be afraid of the offender. And they're clearly not afraid because they had contact with the offender. Sometimes people are making contact because it's a safety strategy. Do you know that old adage, you keep your friends close and your enemies closer? Sometimes victims call offenders to see what kind of mood they're in. What are they thinking? Have they been drinking tonight? What are they saying to other people? Because then they have information and the more information they have, the better they can safety plan. When victims have a stalker who has not made contact and normally they make contact every day and all of a sudden they haven't heard from the offender in two or three days, does the victim think, oh, phew, stalking case is over? Or are they more concerned? Usually they're more concerned because they don't know where they're gonna be at, where they're gonna show up. And so sometimes victims will make contact to get information because that information helps them plan for their safety. And we have all done a really good job at being able to explain the dynamics that happen in a domestic violence case and how complicated they are. And we need to do a better job at explaining the dynamics that happen in a stalking case because it's frequent that the victim will make contact with the offender because they're concerned for their safety. So when we're working to hold offenders accountable in these particular cases, we're looking at a whole bunch of different things. We're looking at the SLI framework. We're looking to see how often this kind of stuff is happening, how long it's been happening, and what's the level of intensity. Because when we put those pieces of the puzzle together, we can oftentimes prove intent. And for those of you that are working in a state that requires that we prove that the offender intended to cause fear or harm to a victim, sometimes people get caught up in saying, I can't prove that the offender intended because the offender's like, I didn't know that I was causing fear to the victim, or I just accidentally showed up at Walmart. How was I supposed to know that that was scary? When we can prove the duration and the intensity and the frequency, we can prove intent because patterns prove intent. And we have an offender who's doing this uh, course of conduct in a pattern of behavior that helps prove intent. So things like looking at the duration about how long this talking has been going on, when we're looking at how intense it is, what areas the victim's life has been impacted, how long has it been happening? Is it happening in public? And how frequently the offender is making contact in keeping in mind that most offenders contact victims on a daily basis. All of those things can help us prove the intent in these particular cases. Now, if you work in a state that doesn't require you to prove intent, yay, <laughs> it's a little bit easier. But if you do work in a state that does require to, you to prove intent, we can help you. Okay, these particular questions can be helpful. If you're struggling on a case, if you're a, a district or attorney or a public or a, a prosecutor, reach out to us. We have access to lots of individuals all across the country who can help pull case law, who can help you strategize categories. If you're a law enforcement officer and you're like, I'm really struggling on this one, can I pick somebody's brain? That's the technical assistance that we offer. Feel free to call us. Because as we work together to build these coordinated community responses, these are the things that we need to be thinking about. Number one, are we screening for stalking within the context of domestic violence and sexual assault? And if you're listening closely, earlier I said you can't just ask victims, are you being stalked? Because they're going to say no. And some of you might have been thinking, well, what am I supposed to ask them then, Jennifer? Ask them these questions. Has somebody been tracking, following, or monitoring you? Has somebody invaded your life and privacy? Is somebody interfering with you through attack, attacking you or assaulting other people? And on more than one time, has someone scared you? Okay. Uh, somebody asked, can we help Canadians? Our grant is uh, US specific, but we're not going to tell you no if you call us and need to brainstorm with somebody. Um, so you are more than welcome to give us a call. Mm -hmm. so. Um, we know that victims don't live singular lives, so you are absolutely welcome to call us. 
Um, and then the last question about is, has somebody on more than one time intimidated or scared you? Okay. Anybody know where those four questions come from? Where did we come up with those four questions? Do I just lay awake at night coming up with them or where do you think we can? Yeah, <laughs> yes, those come from the SLI framework, absolutely. So either you all have seen our presentations before or you are listening well. So kudos to uh, Kelly and Elizabeth. So as we build our coordinated response, thinking about who are we working with? And I gave you some examples on this particular slide, but I intentionally left a piece blank because I don't know your community. You know your community, you know who the players are, you know who it would be important to have around the table, okay? And keeping in mind that not only do we need to think about like what people often refer to as like the big four in coordinated response, usually when we're looking at coordinated response, people think of prosecution, law enforcement, advocacy, and medical professionals. And yes, those are super important to have at the table, but it's also important to think about, as many of you mentioned, the education system, community specific resources, culturally relevant services. It might be a faith community. It might be you know, certain um, agencies within your jurisdiction that are working with victims. Think about who you need to be inviting to the table to work on these particular cases. And maybe you need to start with the training piece. And whenever we're called up and somebody is saying, okay, Jennifer, help us build a coordinated response to stalking. The first thing I ask them is, what does your intra-agency training look like? And they're like, well, what do you mean? Everybody in our police department is trained on stalking or every one of our advocates is trained on stalking. Wait, how often? Do you have a policy on stalking? When's the last time somebody looked at it? So sometimes we need to start with that interest training, as well as thinking about if we're building that coordinated response, are we focusing on risk? Are we identifying those cases that have a higher risk of level of danger to the victim? And so that's one of the ways that you can use the SHARP assessment. Are we having a common language for understanding that we're working on a case? This is the level of risk in a particular case. Some of you might have a more formal process where you're doing multidisciplinary case review, where you're bringing up a particular case, you're kind of staffing it together, et cetera. That's not necessary for everyone to be able to do, okay? If you're already doing it for domestic violence and sexual assault cases, I would encourage you to start doing it for stalking cases, not just intimate partner stalking cases, okay? Are you thinking about the integrated report? approach? Are you making sure that no matter where a victim contacts the system, that they would be referred to the same level of support and accountability? Let me give an example. If a victim comes in to make to a report to law enforcement, is law enforcement always referring to medical professionals, mental health professionals, and advocacy services that can support the victim during the reporting process? If a victim comes in to make a report, um, or work on a case with the district attorney, would they have that same level? If a victim comes in for advocacy support, would they be open to or be informed of the process for reporting through the criminal justice system, the civil justice system? If you're on a campus, what are your campus specific resources? What are your resources off campus? What are your supervision strategies look like? Many times people look at prosecution, law enforcement, medical professionals, and advocacy, and then the offender goes through the criminal justice system and they're put on probation. What's the level of accountability there? Most probation officers have hundreds of people on their caseload. Is there the possibility for an enhanced level of monitoring if the victim or if the offender is put on probation. And that would have to start in the court case and be asked for as part of sentencing. And are we safety planning with victims? And this, it has been my experience that oftentimes people get frustrated and when they're like, well, why do you kind of target safety planning at victim advocates? I'm a police officer and I do safety planning all the time. 
most of us, um, especially like law enforcement and others do safety planning, but you are oftentimes doing tactical safety planning. You're talking with victims about, do you have locks? And are you walking back and forth you know, to your job by yourself? And are you parking under a street light? And are you telling other people about what's been happening? And not necessarily focusing on the emotional support that needs to happen in safety planning as well. Okay, it's not just the physical safety planning. We need to look at the emotional safety planning that happens as well. And that's gonna require a coordinated response. As an advocate, somebody can't do everything. As an officer, they can't do everything, but together we can do a lot better job. So for that internal training, what does that look like? Okay, if you are not eligible to get training from Spark, can you do your own training by doing those particular uh, training uh, modules that I talked about are on our website. Julie, would you mind linking one of those training modules in the chat for folks so they can figure out where to find those on our website? Um, can you listen to the webinars on our archives? Okay, there's at least 10 of them that are on there that can go a really long ways, right? Um, somebody said, is there flyers that are available to hand out to victims? Um, one of the things that Spark develops is materials. So we have brochures, et cetera, available on stocking that people can order. And then you can put, there's room on the back of them to put local information. So you could order the Spark brochure that talks about stocking and then on the back put, you know, such and such crisis center because they're the folks that do the advocacy work or the, you know, gender resource center on your campus, et cetera. So there's room to adapt them. You can either print them out yourselves on our website um, or you can order them from us. As well as, and Julia's throwing a bunch of stuff in the chat there. So um, if you get a chance to at least click on it or take a screenshot, that will help you figure out where to find it on the website. And then thinking about what are your policies and procedures look like? Most of you are on this webinar because you're a champion already, because you already care about this issue. Does everyone in your office, do they have the same level of passion and understanding? What do your procedures look like? If patrol gets a call for slashed tires, would it ever end up in front of somebody who has advanced training and response issues um, and can be able to look at that stocking case in depth? Or would it never make it past the patrol level? Do you train your hotline volunteers so that when somebody calls at two o'clock in the morning for shelter and says it's somebody that I work with, would they identify that it's a stalking case? Would your agency even shelter a victim of stalking if it was an intimate partner? And then we can help you with those individualized technical assistance. If there's a particular case that you're working on and you need to pick somebody else's brain or you're thinking, how do we particularly work on this case? Now understand that's only if you're a responder. If you are a victim who's unfortunately experiencing that, please don't reach out to us because again, we can't work directly with victims, okay? And then what do the practices look like? It's one thing to have a procedure, but if you have a, a policy that's in place uh, for you know, the law enforcement response to stalking, has it been updated to include all the different forms of technology or does it still say that you can fax somebody through a fax machine? Things to think about. So for law enforcement, thinking about, do you have a policy and what kind of training exists for dispatch? Because you all know if dispatch isn't trained on it, they tell us what we're going out to, right? What type of incident reports are made or call logs? How do we divvy things up if it came in as a property crime, but it's actually a crimes against persons? Would it actually land in the lap of the person who would be the best suited to investigate that case? We had a law enforcement agency that we worked with who said, you know, yeah, you're welcome to come in and uh, help us figure out about what to do on um, our stalking cases, but we just don't have a ton of stalking cases. And so right away I was like, hmm, that's a red flag. So we're working with that agency and we said, is somebody reviewing the cases that come in to screen them and identify stalking in property crimes or harassment calls, et cetera. And they started doing that. In fact, they hired somebody to directly do that. And they saw a 70% increase in the number of stalking cases that they were working on because it got mixed within other reports, okay? The other thing to be thinking about is for prosecutors, what do those strategies look like? Are we charging 
stalking within the context of intimate partner violence. And one of the reasons to do so is you get around the, four, the 404B clause. The other prior bad acts that are sometimes difficult to bring in in domestic violence crimes, if you char start charge stalking in conjunction with that, you can go back to the very first incident that happened in a stalking case and include all of that information, which means you may be able to get a lot more information included that gets in front of the judge and the jury than you would have been able to with just a domestic violence charge, okay? We also need to be thinking about we're using risk assessment at that level. Have we considered using expert testimony in stalking cases? Many people are using expert testimony in domestic violence and sexual assault cases, but they don't think about using it in stalking cases. Or are we thinking about what happens in our constant violation of protection order cases? If somebody's violating a protection order over and over again, are they not stalking? Are we thinking about forfeiture by wrongdoing? in our domestic violence cases where the offender has threatened the victim and now the victim's not showing up and they were stalking the victim as part of that. We actually have a guide for prosecutors available on our website that you can access. For those of you that are probation and parole folks, we have guides for monitoring stalking offenders. Are we making frequent field contact? Are we looking for the offender's fixation with the victim? Um, can we put them on a specialized case load or have specialized conditions about us monitoring their social media or seizing property like cell phones, et cetera? We actually have a guide on our website that we co-wrote with the American Probation and Parole Association that talks about how do we enhance the level of monitoring that we have for correction folks who are monitoring pro, um, stalking offenders. For the medical professionals, some of you are like, are they asking about stalking? Are they not? Some of you are like, yes, we are. Others are like, mm, I don't know if we are. Are they screening for stalking behaviors using those four questions that we mentioned earlier? And do they have resources available? This goes for all of us. If you have a victim of stalking come in and when they leave your office, do you have information that you give to them much like you give victims of domestic violence and sexual assault? Most of us have packets of information, including protection order information and safety plans, et cetera, that we give to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Do you have that for victims of stalking? Because if you did, it could include things like a brochure, a reference to all the community resources, a safety plan, the documentation log that I mentioned earlier all of those things. Are your mental health providers skilled with working with stalking victims? Many of us have a, <laughs> a referral list that we use in domestic violence and sexual assault. Are those same individuals skilled in working with victims of stalking? And then of course, for the advocacy folks, what does that look like in your agency? One of the things that a lot of advocacy folks tell me is, oh, I work with victims of stalking all the time, or, you know, we would absolutely work the victim of stalking. But when I look on their website, stalking isn't even mentioned. Domestic violence and sexual assault is, and support groups for domestic violence and sexual assault are, but stalking is not even mentioned on the website. Do you have shelter options available for stalking victims? One of the things that I would encourage you to think about if you're a Victim Services Program is using our checklist that we have on the website that basically says, okay, if you say you're working with stalking victims, you might know that, but do the other people in your community know that? And more importantly, do victims know that? Do you talk about it on your website? Do you have brochures? Do you give presentations on stalking or only on domestic violence? Would your law enforcement even know that if they were working with a stalking victim that they should call you for advocacy efforts? Okay, so go through that checklist that we have available on our website, in addition to the fact that we also have a guide for advocacy folks on how do you respond to stalking, as well as safety plans. And this is available for everyone on some of the safety plans that you can think about using when you're working with a stalking victim. Now for law enforcement, I imagine you're feeling a little left out because you're like, you didn't say any specific law enforcement resources. We have a bunch <laughs> that are right now in the process of being developed. Um, including some policies on model policies on stalking, some stalking checklists, some investigative guides. All of those are in the process of being developed um, and will hopefully be released in, on our website within the next couple of months. So please stay tuned for that. 
in the meantime, reach out to us. We can certainly help you develop, um, give you examples, et cetera. Even if they haven't been OVW approved on our, on our website yet, we can at least point you in the right direction of things that you can begin developing for your own agency. And then last but not least, where do you find all of those things? <laughs> on our website. So if you go to stockingawareness.org, you can look for those practitioner guides, the training modules that we talked about that Julia linked. Um, Julia is going to put a copy of the PowerPoint in the chat again for you, um, as well as signing up for our newsletter. If you want to know as resources and materials are coming out, sign up for our newsletter or just follow us on social media. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn as well. Now, everybody's already started asking, are we going to get certificates for this training? And I'm going to say this as kindly and nicely as possible, okay? There are 300 of you on this webinar. This is my 17th webinar this month. We are a staff of three people. If you absolutely have to have a certificate, you can email us, okay? Please know it will take us weeks to get back to you because we have tons of people requesting the same thing. For those especially of you that are military, et cetera, I know you have to have a certificate for your training purposes, that's fine. Go ahead and email me. For those of you that don't have to have it, you just want it, please consider if you actually really need it before you email us. Not that I don't want to give that to you, but that we literally have 1,500 of them right now sitting waiting to be done. Okay, so please be kind. <laughs> you can certainly reach out to us, send an email to my email that's right here if you absolutely have to have a certificate. If you can do without one, please consider that as well, um, just from the standpoint of bandwidth, um, that it's really hard for us to get those done. Okay, so somebody said, is the presentation going to be sent to you? No, Julia just linked it to you um, in the PDF, and then the recording will be put on the website. So the recording will go up within about two weeks. Um, we have to have it um, closed captioned, et cetera. And that takes about two weeks to get back from um, the TA to TA folks. So it will be on the website, just be patient, um, but it should be up there within the next two weeks or so. Other comments, questions? Okay. If not, we are right at time. Um, so I want to thank you all very, very much um, for what you're doing on an everyday basis to help elevate the safety of victims as well as hold offenders accountable. So thank you for that. Hopefully we gave you some good ideas to either plug into the CCR that you already have or to think about starting one. So in the meantime, thank you all very, very much. Um, check out our social media, sign up for our newsletter. Um, and then of course, check out the website, um, which again is stockingawareness.org. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it and have a great rest of your day.